Hey, 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 this is Dr. Jonathan Shepard here. Smile on my face, I'm feeling good today. Today is Friday, January the 22nd of 2021. We're 22 days into the new year. Welcome to Ask the Doctors uh, broadcast. So glad that you were able to join us today, uh, whether it be morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you might be at. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're so happy that you did. Uh, I want to again thank those who watch us on replay. We have so many followers who go back and uh, view the episodes um, days or even weeks after. And so it's good to know that we're providing information for you all that is helpful, uh, that you are sharing with your friends, your families, uh, even your patients. Uh, I know that there's some people who share things with their communities and their patients. And so I am so happy that we're a part of this. Welcome to another Friday edition. I am feeling good. Uh, I am ready for such a lively discussion today. <clears throat> I don't have too much as far as preliminaries today. Uh, my preliminaries today will be involving my two friends who come on with me once a month to chop it up a little bit. The Dr. Erica Draza, uh, MD, PhD. Uh, she is standing by. And then Dr. Marilyn Griffin uh, is also standing by. Again, just wanted to let you know uh, if you have not heard from me, Happy New Year. Uh, and I hope that this new year brings to you all the success, all the favor, all the new ideas uh, and plans that you look to accomplish this year. So with that said, I'm going to bring Erica on in, Dr. Draza on in, because I want her to be a part of the follow-up. Uh, we're going to talk about today uh, some of the present-day events uh, and how it impacts your mental health. But I need you to stay tuned. I need you to get somebody on this broadcast because we're going to deal with the COVID-19 distribution debacle and even address some of the myths. So I am looking forward to that portion of the show. But let me call, go on and bring on Dr. Erica Draza in. She is here with me. Hey, how are you, Pepper? Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing okay. Um, it's been a tough week. Yeah. Okay, what's been going on? What's been going on, friend? Well, you know, I actually experienced two two deaths, two loss. Oh no, uh, I'm so sorry. Over the last two, I'm sorry, over the last week, last seven days. Oh wow. Yeah, one of my friends who uh, would assist me with personal and business projects, member of my church, uh, Carter Memorial Church in Baltimore, same oh, age as me. We're only less than 25 days apart as far as birth died. What? what happened? Uh, we don't know. Okay. And, you know, typically on this type of program platform, I wouldn't even get into that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Um, yeah. But I do want to say, I want to send my sincere um, condolences to the family of Franklin James. Mm. Um, those who watch, uh, who know who I'm referring to, please keep that family in prayer. Uh, unexpected loss. And uh, actually, within my uh, circle, my circle, which is my church family, this mm -hmm. is the second person of that age group who's died in three months. What? Yeah. So it's, ah. it's a little, you know, a little jarring. Right. Uh, and so, uh, yes, even uh, we uh, doctors and we're human beings that we feel the pain. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other person, uh, uh, Dr. Draza is one of my mentors who traveled with me, or I traveled with her, vice versa, to medical missions. So, you know, I do medical missions. Yeah, and I remember we did that. Yeah, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, one of my mentors, she died Sunday. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, Jonathan. That's awful. I'm so sorry. So it's it, it was a tough week, um, mm -hmm. you know, just handling the different things. Um, you know, so how are you? I know Dr. Griffin. Before, is before I get into that, how do you cope? Because, you know, of course, we, we're we a psychiatrist and we often tell our patients how to cope when we're, we're, you know, when they're struggling and when they're having a hard time, when they're grieving. And I think it's 
helpful sometimes for us to talk. Oh, yes. <laughs> I consider wearing my pearls tonight, too. Um, I got her. <laughs> he did. I had just pulled out my award of the <laughs> Then he added me. Thanks a lot. Well, welcome. welcome, welcome. Well, I was just asking Dr. Shepard because he was saying he's had a couple of losses this week. And, um, you know, of course, as psychiatrists, we are always giving advice to our patients and friends and families about how to how to cope, how to deal with grief. Um, and I'm just curious, how have you been managing? How are you coping this week? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Um, it's a good question because it's one of those things where uh, because of how much loss I encounter in 2020. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why if anybody's heard me talk recently, just because it's a new year doesn't mean it's a new season. That's yeah. right. And I understand that, um, that, that just because the calendar changed uh, as far as the year that there's still some things that are definitely being carried over. Um, how am I how am I dealing with it? Um, I'm a man of faith, you know, so I rely, I rely on my faith in God. Um, I, I do pray, I do meditate, I do read uh, God's word, the Bible. Um, and then I, I'm able to talk, you know, I'm talking to you all. This Again, this is therapeutic for me. Uh, I'm able to share people, uh, share with people how I'm feeling, my feelings. Uh, I'll even share a little bit, even with uh, my colleagues today in some of our group settings, uh, just, just about how I'm doing. And so, just to let you know that it's okay. It's a, it's, it, it's okay to be transparent. That's right. Yeah. Um, when you're transparent, it brings people in, even though you are mm -hmm. their supervisor. You know, you might be working with them, but it lets them know that you feel some of the same things that they may feel. And so it just normalizes, um, humanizes, if that's the right word. I think that's it, humanizes. People want to know that we're human also. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. So sorry about your losses, yeah. Dr. Shepard. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And so oh. just being here. So thank you for the question. You know, Erica, you know, let, let's now Erica is fabulous today. As you see, she got the... Wait, only today? Okay. No. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Dr. Shepard. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Shepard. Uh, how, how, how are you? <laughs> Y'all, this is how we, this is just how we are when we see each other. <laughs> but thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. You know, I, I listen, I'm just channeling inner um, VP, you know, in our first lady, you know, former first lady, Michelle Obama. I'm just, I've been so excited to see Dr. Griffin has on her pearls this week. I had mine on, on inauguration day. It's just, you know, it's, there's a lot going on in the road and a lot of loss. And I've, I've definitely had loss in my family um, last week, but this week I felt hopeful again and i was like wow where was that before you know and i'm mm. starting to see that <laughs> resurface um and i didn't expect it i think i just woke up one day and it felt mm. like something was lifted off of my shoulder you know and mm. i think i didn't realize like the chronic um heightened anxiety that i had with the previous administration of waking up every day thinking, okay, what's he going to do today? Or, you know, what kind of crazy off the chain thing is he going to say? And especially over the last couple of weeks since everything happened, the insurrection at the Capitol, just not knowing what would happen leading up to and especially on inauguration day. So once it finally happened, it, there was just like the sense of peace and the sense of calm. And it reminded me, I should. I should actually have that and try to maintain that no matter what the circumstances. So it was a good learning lesson that, you know, our circumstances shouldn't dictate that level of peace and calm that we experience. Um, so I need to do a better job of trying to channel that um, despite whatever negative circumstance I'm, or situation I may find myself in. So that was, that was my lesson of the week. It's a good lesson. It's a good lesson. It's a good, a good lesson. lesson. Yeah. I think a lot of people can relate to feeling like a weight was lifted, right? And everybody had a sigh of, well, I can't say everybody, but a lot of people and people in my circle, right, had a sigh of relief. 
<laughs> right there, you go. Uh, a sigh of relief. Eighty million people. About eighty million people had about thought. eighty million people. Thank you. And you know, like you say, a sense of renewed hope that we can move forward um, to a new day. You know, think about the whiz. <laughs> so I right, it's a brand new day. I played that the day after. I was like, oh, yes, can you? like the whole thing. You know? <laughs> Yes, the Wiz. Okay, if y'all, we may have some millennials and some um, Gen Z folks watching. Please go back and watch the Wiz. The Wiz, not the Wizard of Oz. The Wiz. Yes, it'll change your life. <laughs> All right. So I got the soundtrack. <laughs> but but you know this is this this is such a again this is organic you all but this is also ties back into why we are doing what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about the mental state of our society. Um, and in particular, we're looking at the mental state of Black America, all right? right. We, we are focused in on that, uh, uh, on this particular show. And, you know, it, it's something that for Black Americans that they felt like there was a weight <laughs> lifted off of them. Yeah. Um, I almost wish we could have done a study, right? Like measuring cortisol levels at the beginning, like four yes. years ago, and then throughout the last four years and then up until today. I think we'd have so much data, but yeah. Wow. But I do think that coupled with the pandemic, coupled with, you know, in the sense of just not having any control, um, mm -hmm. that's at least for myself, I'll speak for myself, um, you know, not knowing when things are going to shift or when things are going to change and feeling like you're just stuck. Um, that is very anxiety provoking. So, um, and feel, and also feeling like you can't predict what's going to happen. You know, not that we all have a crystal ball anyways, but you know, there's been a lot that's gone down between 2020 and the first couple of weeks of 2021. And, um, yeah, just very anxiety provoking. So I think, again, I think it's just like, yeah, we need to <laughs> just pause and be still. And for myself, I'm just grateful um, mm -hmm. where we are now. But I also, I just feel like I need to work better on not carrying that for so long, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was it was a monumental day. Yes. January 20, 20 of 2021. Yes. And it's yeah. one that we must recognize the history. It was overshadowed by so many things and um, it, it, you know, that's why we have to take time to recognize and live in the moment. Um, you know, when we go back and look at how we came through this pandemic and we will come through it, uh, mm -hmm. we have to go back and look at these days like this. Uh, these, these really were days of history, history making. Absolutely. On various levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. You know, I, I I know I know it's tough, uh, but let me tell you, there is some good news. There's some good news on the horizon. You know, I was doing my research even this past week that the coronavirus uh, rates in some states are there starting to decrease. Um, that that's a good thing. You know, there we have been through a tough winter thus far. Uh, we have definitely been through a tough winter thus far, and. With that said, rates have continued to skyrocket. I'm here in the state of Maryland. Um, Maryland has seen some of the highest rates over the last couple of weeks, but things are starting to come down or just stabilize a little bit. Here in Baltimore City, they just now opened up indoor dining to about 25% capacity. Oh, okay. Indoor dining has been closed for the last six weeks. Uh, and you know that's been made a lot of people upset. Um, so, you know, I'm glad that there is some type of uh, um, resolution. I don't know if that's the right word, but just uh, uh, resolution relief or, or whatever we might want to call it. It seems to be on a horizon. Um, and with that sh uh, being shared, I want to just shift us a little bit. So we've all gotten the uh, coronavirus vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine. So before we talk about the debacle and into the myths and stuff like that, which we're going to do later on. Let's just talk about our own personal experiences uh, before our other guests come. Um, you want to start out, Erica? I think you just got it, right? 
I just got it. I just got it because North Carolina um, changed the guidelines um, to include all healthcare workers in this phase, in this current phase. So we're currently um, vaccinating all healthcare workers and individuals 65 and up. And um, once that happened last Friday, I think everybody was on the website. You know, I, I'm here in Durham and I was on the website and calling and apparently the lines went down and the websites went down. I mean, there's just so many people trying to register at the same time. And, um, you know, I was starting to get a little nervous, but there, there was this one sweet night. It was like 11 p.m. and an appointment popped up and I was just like, oh, I couldn't type fast enough to get all my information in so I could get the appointment. Um, so, yeah, so I ended up having to drive to the boonies about an hour from away from Durham um, into what I call Trump world. <laughs> Oh, okay. where am I? We are out here in the boonies in the yeah in the country. We were in the country. Um, I went with my mom, and she was very hesitant to get the vaccine. She doesn't know I'm about to put her on blast right now, but um, she, she and my friend and um, I were having a conversation actually just a few weeks ago, and she was like, oh, "I'm not trying to get that vaccine." She was like, "I don't get the flu vaccine. You don't know what's in it." and you know, you'll probably end up, you know, people who get the flu vaccine end up getting the flu. And if I get this vaccine, I'll probably get coronavirus. I'm not trying to get it. And I'm like, wait, 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 that's not how this works. So, no. you know, we were able to talk a little bit about it, but she was very anxious about the side effects, understandably so. And um, just really scared because, you know, this is so new. This is the fastest we've ever been able to come up with a vaccine in, in such a short period of time. So I think because we didn't have years and years and years of data um, and research, she was very nervous about that. Um, but after telling her a little bit more about um, <clears throat> what's in the vaccine and that it, there's no virus in the vaccine, um, which I think a lot of people believe, um, and then telling her, you know, really doing a, a risk analysis, right? You know, at the end of the day, if you are high risk um, in you know, you, you have asthma, you're a certain age, um, you have other pre-existing health conditions, we really have to think about, okay, what are the risks associated with the vaccine versus the risk of getting coronavirus? So ultimately, the day before, <laughs> she said, okay, I'll do it. So I was so proud of her. We did it together. She was super nervous, but she was able to get it done. Um, so it was a really great process. <laughs> You know, I mean, it had a station for everything. It was socially distanced. Um, the nurses were amazing. I didn't even feel it as it went into my arm. Um, it was super, super easy. Afterwards, maybe about an hour or so afterwards, I did feel a little soreness in my um, upper arm. And it was very similar to what you experience with what I've experienced with the flu shot. And that's pretty much it. So, okay. And what, day did, what, what day did you get it again? I got it yesterday. Yesterday? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I was, you know, it, there's something to be said about like just, again, that anxiety, right, of, um, you know, just knowing that at any moment you can get coronavirus. I mean, you, you're, there's always some level of risk unless you literally are staying in your house 24-7 and never leaving, right? So I think for me, I just didn't realize like that baseline level of anxiety I had about it. And even though I'm not fully, you know, immune to it, I still have to get my second dose and then I have to wait for my body to produce antibodies. There was just like this relief that came over me. I just felt, I was like, oh my God, I just feel, I'm so excited. It's a good moment in science too. You know, the fact that we were able to create something like this for a period of time, the fact that one of the main people who Developed this vaccine as a black woman, you know, that's a busy. I was just like, this is just a great, a great week. I was, I was just so relieved. I'm so relieved. So, yeah, that's my experience. Marilyn, tell us about your experience. So, my experience was a little bit different. And, Dr. Draza, you talked a lot about the first one since you just got it yesterday. So, I'll talk about the, the second. Um, vaccine because I have been blessed and fortunate enough to have had um, both the first and the second shot. Um, you know, the logistics are, are all the same. You know, I think every institution or entity that is 
um, that is administering the vaccine are going through this, you know, having the same protocols, making sure they're social distancing and things like that. And so that you don't have um, a significant wait to receive the, the vaccine. Um, however, after the first one, I, I just had soreness at the injection site for maybe two days, three. Um, I did have to take some ibuprofen because the, the pain was, was quite a bit. But same thing that I had received, um, I had experienced after getting the flu shot. Now, that second dose was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. As some of um, my friends and colleagues have warned about, um, the side effects can be more pronounced with the second vaccination. I was fine um, the day of. I had received it about 6.30 p.m. on a Tuesday evening. This one, it did sting a little bit when it when the injection was administered. The first one, I didn't feel a thing. I was like, oh, wait, you did? You're done? This one, it stung a little bit. And I would say less than 24 hours after, I started experiencing chills. Um, I was feverish. Luckily, uh, my temperature did not go higher than 100.4. Um, but I was just feeling really crappy. Mm. Um, and it was, I hadn't felt that after a flu shot or any other vaccine. Um, I was able to, you know, continue to work because I, I had to work, but I, I felt pretty bad for almost 36 hours. Mm. Um, and I did take, uh, Tylenol as well as ibuprofen, um, to, and I got some relief and, you know, did whatever else you do, you would do to, um, to help manage cold and flu symptoms. So, um, I was back to myself 100% within, I'd say three days. Now, Marilyn, given those symptoms that you experienced with the second one, of course, Look, I was like, oh, yeah, brand new day. I'm feeling hopeful. And then now she's like, yeah, that second dose, so girl. Like, hey, <laughs> but look, look, I am again. still it again. happy and excited that I am vaccinated. Yes, because mm -hmm. those, you know, 24 hours of feeling intermittent chills and feverish, I can still say, you know, that's probably nothing compared to the symptoms that individuals that have had COVID-19 have experienced. Um, I too, and I'm sure, you know, you all have know people that have had it, that was hospitalized, um, those that have died due to complications of it. And so, yes, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Awesome. Yes, Got it. absolutely, yes. Got it. No. Dr. Griffin, somebody's asking, which one did you get? Did you get Moderna or Pfizer? I got Pfizer. Pfizer. And thanks. I'm sorry, you all. I I um, was trying to pull up Facebook on another device so I could manage the chat, but that's too much. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I got the Pfizer okay. uh, vaccine. Cool. Gotcha. And yes, again, absolutely. Yes, I would do it again over and over. Because we may have to do it again anyway, because we're thinking that it's going to, um, it's going to be like the flu vaccine where we'll have to get it annually. Right, because there's so many mutations with this virus. You know, I'm I'm glad you mentioned your side effects. Though I think I I was talking with a friend last night, and she was debating whether or not she wanted to get it, and she was really concerned because she has a pre-existing condition. And there wasn't enough research on individuals who had mm -hmm. her condition. So she wasn't sure, okay, what, you know, I don't know what side effects I'm, I would get, you know, at higher risk for getting some of the really, you know, serious um, side effects. But at the end of the day, she came to the conclusion that, you know what, even if I have some side effects from this vaccine, it seems like they're gonna be transient. You know, they're not gonna last long. It may be rough for a day or two, but that's still far better than having a pre-existing condition and dealing with the consequences and the aftermath of having COVID. So she actually ended up going ahead and getting well, it. Let me, let me and I will add, I know, I know you're gonna have, um, yeah, you got some surprises yeah, yeah. for us and we gotta move on. But I also wanna say that the CDC and the government, they are tracking 
yeah. um, those that have um, receive the vaccine and any type of side effects. There is a website where you log in and um, they will check in with you on a daily basis um, for the first few days after you have received the vaccine so that they can monitor and track any side effects. Um, so that's, I think that's very important um, for everyone to know is that um, your side effects will be tracked and if they, um, last longer than a few days. I even think in the app, it'll tell you, you know, to contact your primary care provider for further assistance and care. But I believe most of the, the side effects have been very transient. All right, Dr. Shepard, back to you. <laughs> right, and I'm the host, right. That's why I, that's why I, gotta I think Erica the host today, actually. No, she ain't the host. So. <laughs> she might. I have my velvet on, so yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The, the, reason, the, reason, the reason why we got to interrupt us is because as physicians, uh, we can have a slant uh, and we have to make sure that we're covering all bases. Um, you know, and one of the things I even said to somebody today is that when you put somebody in front of you who has concerns, it shifts and it even softens your approach. Uh, and it should. As it, and so that's what we're going to do now, because... Yes, we as physicians, we have the confidence uh, and we believe in the science. But let me tell you, uh, everyone out there is not on board. Uh, and we know that. And uh, thankfully that there is a turning of the tide where there is more confidence growing uh, as you look at the statistics uh, that, there, that there are more and more people who are uh, going to go pursue uh, to uh, have the vaccine. Uh, but I want to bring on uh, two people uh, two people who I know. Uh, one is Stephanie Ford, uh, and I asked for her to come on uh, because she's going to uh, serve as that face. All right. Uh, yes, we appreciate the comments. And really, this is the time where you need to go grab somebody and be on this broadcast uh, because myself, Dr. Griff and Dr. Draz, we're all about to learn here. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, I need you all to go do that. Share this video, like it, um, because we want to make sure that everybody gets this information as much as possible. Um, so Stephanie, she's going to kind of serve as that person. I'm going to introduce her, um, and she's just going to read off just some, some questions that she has. Um, and then we have the doc. Uh, this is Ask the Doctors, and we have an infectious disease uh, expert. Uh, if, if Dr. Fauci looked like a woman, this would be the per <laughs> Dr. Jessica Queen. Uh, she is no joke. And uh, I've known Jessica for a long time and have seen her through uh, so many of the different uh, phases of her career. And so she's here in Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And so we're so fortunate to have her uh, come on at this time. And even the doctors, the psychiatrists, we're going to be learning uh, a couple of things here too. Uh, but thank you. Uh, and I'll share my experience later. But thank you, Dr. Draza. Thank you, Dr. I mean, uh, two different contrasts. And so maybe they have some uh, ways to the, uh, show us to how to be able to handle what you dealt with, uh, Dr. Griffin. So I'm going to bring on Stephanie first. All right. And then we're going to bring on uh, Dr. Queen. Hey, Stephanie. Hello. Can y'all hear me? Hi, Hi Stephanie. Yes. Yes. Stephanie yes. Ford. Yes. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. How are you? You ladies doing? And Dr. Shepard? Yeah, good. You look good. good. I love this. Yeah, that is so pretty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, allowing me the opportunity to participate. I'm really excited. <laughs> Absolutely. And we're excited to have you. And come on in, Dr. Jessica Queen. Hey. Hello. Hello. Hey, Jessica. Hello. Dr. Queen. <laughs> Jonathan, I saw you were trying to rest back control uh, the <laughs> strong female voices, and then you brought in two more strong female voices. Right. <laughs> That's all right. I'm okay. I realized that. I re <laughs> yeah, you know, this this goes back years. So, you know, they always be trying to tell me what to do. They get, you know, even, always try to tell me. Even, even when we get together at our conventions and try to tell me what to eat, where to go eat. <laughs> <laughs> Lord. Anyway, anyway, anyway. So, yes, these are these are my sisters, and so. Uh, but again, I want to shift though to the to to the distribution debacle, 
Um, and I want to shift to the COVID-19 myths. So uh, since we got Stephanie here, let's just start. Uh, so Stephanie, um, you know, just kind of uh, give us a quick summary as to what you've been hearing um, and then <laughs> share, <laughs> share what some of your angst may be, if there mm -hmm. is any. I want to speak for you. Uh, and then I know that you provided some questions for us and just start firing away. All right. OK, so um, I do have some family members that have received the vaccine um, like you. They had, you know, soreness in the arm or um, one had a fever both times with the booster shot and with the original shot. And then other people, they were fine. So, um, of course, we've heard other things such as there's like sterilizing agents in there um, that you, uh, there might be some carcinogens, like, you know, it might have some cancer causing agents in the vaccine, um, uh, that it was create, it will alter your DNA. And of course, um, we've been seeing a lot of different, uh, uh, horrible reactions. There was one woman that was having some convulsions, like a seizure, but she couldn't stop and she was, but she was awake and supposedly she's going to different places. So, um, I know that some people will have adverse reactions. I had a, a bad reaction to um, a pneumonia and a tetanus shot at the same time. So I'm very leery of getting the shot. I had to be on bed rest for a week. It was horrible pain. So um, I'm very leery of getting the shot. But I have prepared some questions because, um, you know, I, I guess getting the vaccine is the best way so that we can all get back to some type of normalcy once everyone is vaccinated. But um, there are some people that still have uh, a lot of doubts, doubts in the vaccine and doubts in the government as well, since they're pushing it. So because we all know, like with the Tuskegee experiment, you know, how do how do we bring back the faith in the government and the vaccine that people can trust it? So um, but I do have some questions. So my first question is, can Someone please explain the difference in the available vaccines, such as the Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, and I think soon uh, the AstraZeneca company will have one. You want to take that, uh, Jessica? Sure, I can tackle that. Um, so, Stephanie, you already uh, said a lot of important, <laughs> profound things. Yeah. Um, and I think I just want to highlight your point that, um, you know, there are good historical reasons why our community and others have distrust of medicine, of the government, um, ongoing reasons why we have distrust of the government. Um, so, you know, I think we have to acknowledge that reality um, and, uh, you know, dismissing it is not helpful. Um, you know, I appreciate formats like this where we have physicians from these communities where we can, you know, speak to our personal experiences and our professional experiences and try to bridge the gap. Um, so to address your specific question, um, uh, there are several different kinds of vaccines. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that are currently um, approved for emergency use by the FDA, they're both what are called mRNA vaccines. So to keep it simple, um, essentially, um, you know, there's a genetic code for every living thing, every cell in our body, um, and even for viruses. Um, and it's sort of the, uh, the blueprint um, that uh, makes um, uh, the material that makes up that organism or that virus. Body. So um, what we start with is a genetic code called DNA. Um, that is uh, transcribed or um, um, uh, turned into RNA, and then RNA is the blueprint to make proteins. So um, mRNA vaccines um, are just what they sound like. Um, it's RNA that when it goes into your body's cells, your body makes the protein that's actually a virus protein. It's called the spike protein. So you might have seen cartoons of the COVID virus that are like a circle with spikes coming out. Those spikes coming out are the spike protein. Um, so basically it's a way of delivering sort of just one part, the coding um, of the virus and your immune system learns to recognize that and that's what it makes antibodies against. So if you get exposed to the virus in the future, it'll see that spike protein around the outside and know to attack it. Um, 
So that's how they work. They give the blueprint for that protein. The AstraZeneca virus, um, it essentially does a very similar thing, but delivered in a different way. Um, it's what we call an adenovirus vaccine. Um, adenoviruses are a different kind of virus, um, such as the cold virus. They're one of the viruses that cause the cold. Um, the, reason, the reason we use adenoviruses is we've studied them for decades and we sort of know how to manipulate them. And so we have this adenovirus where they've stripped out all the bad stuff. It's just sort of like a vehicle. And we give it a piece of this time DNA, so it's a different form of genetic code um, from the COVID virus. So the adenovirus um, sort of takes it into the cell and then gives it to our cells. And then that DNA goes to RNA, goes to that same spike protein. Um, so they all work in a very similar manner, which is taking that one piece of the COVID virus and giving it to our body so our body can recognize how to fight it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. it does. Good. Okay. It does. Um, <clears throat> so why was mRNA used to create the vaccine as opposed uh, as opposed to like a, uh, a weaker version or a live uh, version of the virus? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, there are different advantages and disadvantages to the different types of vaccines. Um, and basically, you know, there were over a dozen different companies trying to make a vaccine at the same time, and they all took different approaches for their various reasons. So there are also um, potential vaccines in the pipeline that are weakened, or what we call attenuated viruses. So that type of vaccine might ultimately end up on the market as well. Um, it's not really any better or worse. It's just sort of what approach did the individual companies take? Okay. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> Oh, These are good answers. Thank you. Yeah, they are. Um, and I have a few questions. So when you when you receive the vaccine, <laughs> does this prevent you from getting the virus and prevent you from spreading the virus? Okay, you're asking really good questions. Yeah. Um, really good questions. So um, I can uh, speak in particular for Pfizer and Moderna because I read those studies myself. Um, when they did the trial. Their, the outcome they looked at was people with symptomatic COVID-19. So when you hear that they are 94 and 95% effective, they're 95% effective at stopping the person from having COVID with symptoms because that's what they measured. Um, so we don't know for certain that it stops you from getting the virus, just that it stops you from getting ill. And so we don't know if it stops you from spreading it to others. Um, now, if you think about it logically, um, somebody who is sick and coughing and spreading their droplets everywhere is more likely to transmit the virus than someone who's feeling well, um, but they can still transmit. We know that we have asymptomatic transmission. Um, so this is why we tell people to continue to wear masks and socially distance even after they've been vaccinated. I think there will be future studies that try to answer those questions, um, but we don't know the answers yet. And again, I think you're, you're doing such a great job, Dr. Queen, of breaking this down. Because this is like serious science. It's like amazing science. And <laughs> Sometimes it can be really hard, I think, to, you know, just really comprehend and understand it, even for us as doctors. So um, I just really appreciate you breaking it down like that. And I just wanted to add a, as a reminder, again, because of that spike protein, we're creating those antibodies. So that doesn't mean we may not necessarily get the virus. So that's why we could still transmit it to other people. And I think a lot of folks are making the assumption that, all right, once I get vaccinated, no more mask. I don't need to wash my hands anymore. <laughs> It's like, no, 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 you still are going to have to wear your mask and you're still going to have to wash your hands. You should be doing that anyways, washing your hands. But, <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, I think that is a misconception that if you get the vaccine then all of a sudden that means we don't have to live this this way with the mask and everything. I mean, things are eventually going to start getting better, but we still have to be mindful of protecting those around us so that we're not um, spreading it around spreading the disease mm -hmm. in an asymptomatic way. 
It's good. Can I ask another question? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> so a lot, of I'm prepared. <laughs> yes, yes. a lot of African-American yeah. people have um, different autoimmune diseases such as like lupus or, um, you know, multiple sclerosis or, uh, um, you know, different things, uh, sickle cell. So are this population of people, should they hold off getting the virus? I mean, the vaccine or should they go ahead and get them like, if they go get the vaccine, do you think that it will cause some other issues, um, reactions with them and their their health, their diseases that they have? That's a good question and, and one that I've heard before. Um, so um, in the trials for the vaccines, they didn't exclude people um, from the trials who had some of those pre-existing conditions, um, but we don't have any specific data on um, how people fared with the vaccine who may have had those conditions. Um, I don't think they had enough people enrolled to sort of do that type of statistical analysis. Um, the recommendation from the CDC is um, that having an autoimmune condition, including several of those that you mentioned, that is not a reason to, to uh, not get the vaccine. Those people should be vaccinated. Um, you know, I think anybody who has a concern about a particular health condition should, of course, talk to their primary physician. Um, but there's essentially no pre-existing chronic condition that is felt to be a contraindication to the vaccine. The only reason someone should not get the vaccine is if they have had an anaphylactic reaction to their first dose of the vaccine or to a component of the vaccine. Making the decision around who to align your giving knowledge with takes a great deal Sorry of diligence. That. That's me. That's you. You good, host? Sorry about that. I was going through some of these myths and then something pops up. <laughs> like an auto ad, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't an auto ad, yeah. No, this is great. This is great. One thing I... I'm curious to know, um, Dr. Queen, what do you think about folks who, um, you know, may have cancer or, you know, like really who, who may be getting treatments like chemotherapy and, you know, they don't, they don't have any ability to really build up mm. an immune system to create that, those antibodies, right, in, re in response to the spike protein. Do you know anything about that? Um, it's a really good question. Um, you know, uh, the CDC does recommend that people who are severely immunocompromised get the vaccine because they're at high risk from severe COVID. Um, but as point out, um, for people who um, either from their condition or their treatment have a very suppressed immune system, you know, we expect that they might not have as good of an immune response. Um, sometimes in those situations, we have formal recommendations to repeat vaccination at a later date. Um, those recommendations don't exist yet for the COVID vaccines, but I think maybe will happen in the future. Um, so, uh, yeah, so those people should be getting them um, and continue to take extra precautions because their immune response might be weaker. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There, Can I jump in with a question? Yeah, go ahead. And then we this will be really comments. quick, uh, yep. Dr. Queen. We hear um, a lot of talk about herd immunity. Yeah. And, um, you know, now that people are getting vaccinated, those that are a little hesitant um, may feel like they are still safe if a certain number of people around them get it. So if you don't mind talking to us a little bit about herd immunity, what that is and how we achieve it. Great question. Um, so I think the issue with uh, relying on other people getting vaccinated is if too many of us do that, we won't achieve herd immunity. Um, and I think you, you can see pockets around the country where enough people are refusing the vaccine that I'm concerned that, you know, the majority of the population won't be vaccinated. Um, so the idea with herd immunity is if enough people are vaccinated against um, an infection. Uh, that means that's you know one fewer person, a hundred fewer people, a thousand fewer people who are going to be sick from that disease, um, and therefore over time it will spread less and less in the community. Um, so the idea is that once you get a certain percentage of people vaccinated, 
it'll sort of drop that curve enough that it'll protect everyone there um, just by virtue of being around so many vaccinated people. Um, and we rely on this principle for all of our vaccinations because for you know various immunizations, there are certain people who can't get them. So we talked earlier about weakened virus vaccines. People who are immunocompromised can't always get that type of vaccine. Um, so they rely on the rest of the healthy population to get the vaccine and that protects them. Um, but herd immunity only works if we all sort of buy in. If you're someone who um, can safely get the vaccine, you know, you have to do your part to get it so that you protect your community and your neighbors and your family. Gotcha. That's great. Thank you. Great. There's a question here about a viewer uh, asking about uh, pregnancy. Uh, what's the science on the vaccine and newly pregnant women? Um, then they have a couple of comments. So can you give- Hey, Sean, I just want to say, this is a friend of mine from high school that's asking this question. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Sean. Very good question. Um, and uh, you are correct that pregnant women were not included in the trials. So we don't have specific data about them. I can tell you that in terms of COVID infection, pregnant women who get it are more likely to have severe symptoms and have to be hospitalized. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to also take that um, into account when you're doing the risk benefit analysis. I can just tell you, you know, anecdotally, I have a number of um, friends and colleagues who are doctors or other medical professionals who are pregnant, some of whom are um, either late in their first or early in their second trimester. Um, and of the handful of women I know who've had to make that personal decision, all of them decided to get vaccinated because they felt that um, uh, protecting themselves um, and their unborn child from severe COVID infection was worth um, the risk of getting a vaccine that hadn't been studied in their population. Um, so, you know, that's one where we advise people to make a personal decision, but um, just like everyone else, we're more concerned about um, the side effect or the consequences of getting COVID than we are about potential side effects from the vaccine. Um, yeah. So if it, if it were my loved one or myself making that decision, you know, my recommendation would, would, would be to get the vaccine. I've talked to actually a few OBGYNs about this. I have a few friends, um, one of which was in New York, you know, right in the prime of all of it, you know, when mm -hmm. he saw COVID firsthand um, and how it just ripped through all of New York. And he um, and another friend of mine also shared that, yeah, COVID in pregnant women is really, really bad. And they have been recommending pregnant women go ahead and get the vaccine as well. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Stephanie, what what other questions you got? I mean, yeah, I have know. more. <laughs> so speaking of pregnant, um, I am still a spring chicken. I've not had children yet, <laughs> but um, I have heard that there are some sterilizing agents in the vaccine, and that if you get it later down the road, you might not be able to have children. So, and of course, this is all the population control thing that everyone's talking about. Um, is there any evidence of sterilization, um, anything like that in the vaccine? So uh, good question. Um, no, there's no evidence that the vaccine uh, can cause sterilization or affect your reproductive system in any way. Um, you know, my understanding is that uh, this uh, myth started spreading really from just sort of an unfounded website. Um, and then kind of caught fire on social media. Um, and I think it plays in a lot of people's uh, fears and again, some historical atrocities in our country where certain populations were forcefully sterilized. Um, uh, but I don't even think really the technology would exist to hide a sterilizing component in a RNA vaccine. It just is not the way it, the science doesn't make sense to me. Um, you know, I think if people have faith in conspiracy theories, there probably isn't a lot I can say to combat that, only that there is no evidence of anything related to sterilization um, in any of the vaccines. Um, not something that I have any personal concern about. 
Um, not a spring chicken, but I don't have any kids of my own yet either. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't worried about that issue. Yeah. All right. Come on here, spring chicken. I, like <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What's the age cut off for spring chicken? <laughs> I say I'm a spring chicken. My dad, he's like, you're not a spring chicken anymore. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, on, so sure. I have I had COVID back in December. Um, I experienced a few complications afterwards. About a month afterwards, I was having trouble breathing actually a few weeks ago. And so now I have, I guess, the antibodies in my body. So should I go get the vaccine or do I have some time to hold off and wait a little while before I go get it? Another great question. Um, so ultimately you should get vaccinated, um, but yes, you do have some time. So um, the recommendation is, you know, if anybody actively has COVID that they recover before they worry about getting vaccinated. As you stated, um, you do have protective antibodies for some period after your infection. We don't really know how long there are um, at least small numbers of people who have been reinfected at some point, but it doesn't seem to happen very quickly in the first few months. Um, so we recommend um, that people do get the vaccine, but it can be delayed a little bit. And you can talk to your doctor about sort of when the, the timing is right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. For sure. that. That's great. That's and I'm glad, great. I'm glad you're recovering. That sounds like a... Uh, Thank you. <laughs> a difficult time. I will say that um, some people uh, have reported um, that when they did get vaccinated, you know, months after they uh, recovered from COVID, um, that some of the symptoms that they had um, after their vaccine were sort of milder versions of what they experienced with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so again, something to talk about with your doctor and to expect potentially. That's okay. good. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Yes. Stephanie, we're so glad that you recovered. Uh, yeah. from, from COVID-19. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's a question here from Charlene Henderson. Uh, she says, I'm so confused. If you get the vaccine, you still have to wear a mask and do our due diligence. So why take the vaccine? Can we still get the virus if we get the vaccine? Right. right. So um, there's a small chance, about 5%, that you would still get uh, COVID and have symptoms, even if you're fully vaccinated, just because, you know, I don't think there are any 100% effective vaccines. But the main reason is actually to protect others. Um, so um, you may have heard us talking earlier about the fact that uh, we suspect you may still be able to pick up the virus and spread it to other people, um, even if you don't get sick yourself. Uh, so the idea is that you're protecting those around you by continuing to wear a mask. Gotcha, gotcha. And you know, who knows how long this will have to continue on. Um, right. I tell people that we could be wearing masks for another year. Um, is 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 that right, uh, Dr. Queen? Is it, you know, is that a fair timetable or? Well, it it depends. Um, but I I think that's a very reasonable expectation. Um, it depends if uh, our current um, administration can uh, help improve the speed of the vaccine rollout and with cooperation of all the state and local um, government and health departments. And then are we gonna get buy-in from enough of the population that we're able to reach sort of that level of herd immunity? Um, so I think even in an ideal world, that will take months. Um, I think the more, um, equipped we are to speed up that process, the better we'll all do. Um, and I think it remains to be seen uh, how quickly and in what ways the virus will continue to mutate. Um, I believe there was a comment right before I came on about potentially having to get revaccinated annually, sort of like the flu shot. Right. You know, the reason we have to do that for flu is the flu mutates quickly. Um, and uh, coronaviruses are able to do that. Um, so I think there are still a lot of variables, um, but I think mask wearing is going to be a part of our lives for a long time. Um, and I think, you know, there might be some value into us wearing masks during cold and flu season, even once COVID's under control. Um, the annual, I mean, the um, national flu numbers are a tiny fraction of what they normally are. And it's because we are 
wearing masks and staying away from each other. So that's great. That's great. Um, Stephanie, uh, first of all, thank you again for being the face of, yeah, thank you. of those who are uh, <laughs> on the fence and have a lot of questions. Um, I want to make sure because we're going to start bringing it to a close here. What other questions, if there's any other questions, uh, do you have? Um, the booster shot. Why? Why is there a booster needed? And if if I don't get the booster, then is the vaccine ineffective? The first shot, like null and void. Uh, good question. So um, the simple answer about why you need a booster is um, the first dose, um, you know, gives your immune system this spike protein. It, it says, okay, this is foreign, I'm going to attack it. Um, and then you end up having production of antibodies. Um, and those are kind of circulating in your blood and the numbers die down once you know some time passes. Um, and then the second dose is to re-expose your immune system so that it gets smarter and better at quickly um, you know, producing all those antibodies and attacking um, the protein or if you get infected, the virus. Um, it, I don't want to get too into the weeds, but there's sort of a special um, force that's part of the immune system army um, called memory T cells, and they get turned on by that second dose. Um, so it just enhances the protection. Um, we have some estimates of how much protection you get from the first dose based on the vaccine studies. Um, so basically, you know, they gave the first dose to the thousands of people. Um, and then um, there were some people who got COVID between the first and the second dose. And based on that, we have an estimate of sort of how much protection you had. Um, and I'll just say ballpark, it's about 50%. So after your, a couple of weeks after your first dose, you have about 50% protection. And then a couple of weeks after the second dose, you have 95% protection. So it's a big difference. Um, so, you know, if there is some unavoidable issue, like you have an anaphylactic reaction to the first dose, you'll still have some protection, but it's um, definitely advised to go back for the second dose. Okay. I Thank you so much, Dr. Queen. I want to make sure we get to this one last question. I know, Dr. Shepard, you're going to wrap us up real quick, but I think it's so important. No, um, no, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Uh, if you get the vaccine, does it protect you from the two new COVID strands that are being identified? And mm. yeah, there are there are additional variants, right? Um, especially you may have heard of the one that started in UK, we believe, um, that may be a little bit more contagious and may actually result in more um, side symptoms. Um, and what they've been finding so far is that the vaccine still protects against that variant. So, and there are a few other variants as well. So that's a great question. And I think we're gonna hear a lot more about those variants. And from what I understand, we will probably see that variant rise within the next month or two, um, like around February or March. Wow. Someone asked about um, about a question with, regarding a pregnancy. Um, so my daughter-in-law had COVID during the summer and is doing very well. However, she's three months pregnant now. And my question is, would the baby be born immune to COVID? That's my uncle. Hey, hey uncle. uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, uncle. Um, it's a really good question. I don't I don't think we have the, the data yet to answer it. Um, I will admit that I'm not up to date on the COVID and vaccination and pregnancy data. Um, that's not my area of expertise. Um, we do know that um, uh, babies do get protective antibodies um, from their mothers in the womb and or from breast milk, um, but uh, not all antibodies are created equal. So um, there isn't like a blanket answer. Um, so I don't believe we know yet. Um, I think there, uh, is hope that there will be some uh, protection um, transmitted. And that's part of why we recommend pregnant women get vaccinated. Um, but also that having um, the mom and the rest of the household vaccinated protects the baby just because the house is, is less likely to have to have COVID. Gotcha, gotcha, that's good. Um, Erica Dixon asked this question. 
Uh, I know part of the answer, but I can't remember which one. That's my Zumba teacher. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. We got all these different people joining in. This is this is wonderful. Uh, she asked the question uh, that she heard that there was a vaccine that only requires one dose. Is this true? Uh, the answer is yes, it is true. I just can't remember if it's Johnson and Johnson or is it AstraZeneca? AstraZeneca. Or is it both? Um, I, well, I don't know which one it is. Um, AstraZeneca, their trials use two doses. So, yeah, probably thinking of Johnson and Johnson. So it must be Johnson. Mm -hmm. Johnson. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 So there is one out there that's supposed to be coming. Uh, neither of these have been approved yet uh, in the United States of America. Uh, I am hearing that they are using them in other countries. Um, I do want you to speak to something beforehand uh, because we did say something earlier and I want to uh, clarify. Um, yes, the vaccine was produced at what we consider rapid speed, Operation Warp Speed. You know, I hate that name. <laughs> if, if I had been developing it, if I had, this, I would, I would have chosen a different name. I'll be honest with you, because the thing about it is, coronaviruses are not new. They've been around for a long time. I remember learning about them in medical school. Mm -hmm. uh, so they've been around. Also, people have been studying how to be able to create vaccines for coronaviruses for a long time. So it wasn't like this is something brand new, so we had to start from scratch. Yep. I, I think that's a very important point for people to understand why we're able to get such a fast start and there's such a jump start on how to be able to create a vaccine in this particular case, because number one, we knew what we were dealing with. Number two, we have had people who've been studying it for quite a while, so it was a playbook already. Mm -hmm. So we just had to adjust that playbook to what our current condition is. Um, and also the technology, right? So yeah, coronaviruses have been out. And Dr. Kizzy, again, look her up. It's Dr. Mm -hmm. Kizmikia, but yep. mm -hmm. you know, we like in the community, we all call her Dr. Kizzy. I hope she's okay with that. Um, <laughs> and I get to, <laughs> My hashtag when I got my vaccine, I'm like, I'm on that kizzy. <laughs> she had already been doing the research on coronavirus. So she just happened, you know, it was just kind of like circumstance, right? That is like, oh my gosh, we have this woman who's actually been doing work on trying to develop a vaccine on coronavirus. And the technology in terms of the mRNA that's being used for this virus, that technology had already been worked on and developed. So I think. Um, it's really important to to acknowledge that. Absolutely, absolutely. So just want to add a little bit of clarification to that. I think this is a good uh, stopping point. <laughs> Stephanie, how do you feel with the answers and responses that you have received? I feel a lot better, I do. Okay. So um, maybe when it becomes available, I'll be signing up to get it. Right. My father went and got it yesterday and wow. um, he's doing well, mm -hmm, so. <laughs> I'm like, let me, let me know. You know, and the the running joke, everybody's like, "Oh, you got the virus? Or you got the vaccine? You know, let me know if you start growing a third arm or something crazy." So right now, he's doing fine. <laughs> well, you know, uh, and and to be serious, you know, we'll bring you back, you know, to let the people know, yeah. uh, because this is good. Uh, you know, it's it's wonderful to see the comments and us showcase them and we read them, uh, but to, to have a face of someone. Uh, and, and again, uh, Stephanie, thank you. And I'm not just saying it to be saying it, but this this takes courage. Yeah, um, it does. You do what you do. Mm -hmm. And this is what you should do when you go to the doctor. This is a perfect example. Let me just highlight that. Yeah. When you go to see your physician, uh, you go see one of us, psychiatrists, infectious disease, OBGYN, uh, primary care, dermatologist, it doesn't matter. This is what a session should look like. You come prepared, you come with some questions, um, and you should be able to get the answers. And if, just like Dr. Queen, there were certain er areas that she was not aware of, and she told you right up front, this is not my area, I have to look into it, and I'll get back to you. So this is a perfect example of how uh, we hope that your interactions are going on uh, with your doctor and medical health professionals. All right, wonderful job. Thank you again, Stephanie Ford. Thank you again, Dr. Thank Jessica. You, Dr. Thank, you. thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you for having yeah. me. Yeah, thank you for help outnumbering me. <laughs> <laughs> you brought it upon yourself, though, that I have to say. 
Oh, I, oh, I brought it up. Oh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Draza. And uh, thank you, Dr. Marilyn Griffin. And uh, we're so happy. And look for us again. Uh, Dr. Draza, Dr. Griffin are with me every month at the end of each month uh, on Let's Chop It Up. We try to end up each month just talking about the things that are happening. Uh, yes, normally the fourth and fourth Friday for those who've been keeping tune uh, with us. Again, Hope Health System, sponsor of this particular broadcast. Uh, we'll do you some good if you come on over. Uh, HopeHealthSystem.com, uh, number 410-265-8737. Please remember the four W's again, even though you got your vaccine. I think Maryland's the only one. No, Dr. Queen, you've gotten both doses, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So myself, Dr. Draza, we've only gotten one. And uh, Stephanie, we believe she's going to get it when it comes. But in the meantime, we're going to remember the four <laughs> W's. <laughs> Wear your mask, wash your hands, watch your distance, and wait on gathering. All right, that's the last. Yes. All right, W. All right, so hang on tight, guests. I'm going to sign off. Uh, thank you all again for watching. Please share this video. Uh, this information today is life changing. And so please, let's go ahead and share this. Call somebody, let them know they need to get a hold of this copy of this video on this broadcast. You can go back. I don't normally say this, and I am ending. You can go back to the uh, Hope Health Systems. Uh, page, Facebook page, and you can watch the entire episode. And thank you all for those who are watching the replay. Good night. Have a safe weekend. Good night. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody.